problems that develop in people at high altitude. And I'll throw in a little bit on uh, prevention as well. And in terms of the goals and objectives, at the end of the session, ideally you're gonna be able to describe some of the normal physiologic responses to hypobaric hypoxia and how people feel different when they're in this environment. Uh, you should be able to identify the primary forms of acute altitude illness and some other problems that might develop with exposure to high altitude. And finally, the hope is that you'll be able to outline a basic treatment approach to the main forms of acute altitude illness and also talk a little bit about uh, prevention with patients that you might be seeing in clinic. Now, in terms of where these issues uh, come into play, uh, acute altitude illness typically occurs when people get above about 8,000 feet or higher in elevation. So any of the areas that you see marked in this crude map of the world in black are regions where you can get up and stay above about 8,000 feet for a long enough duration of time, and as a result might be at risk for developing one of these problems. So in the U.S., the main areas are going to be the Rocky Mountains, uh, as well as the Sierra Nevada, but portions of Canada up into Alaska. The Andes Mountains stretching from the north all the way down to the southern end of South America, parts of Europe, scattered parts of Africa. People often don't think about the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, but it's quite high in elevation. Parts of the Middle East and then the most noteworthy area of all, again, we have the Himalaya Mountains in Nepal, India, Tibet, Bhutan, uh, and uh, China. When people are traveling into these regions, they need to think about altitude and illness and be able to recognize, uh, prevent, and treat it. Now, the main thing that happens when people go up to high altitude that puts them at risk is that the barometric pressure declines with increases in elevation in a somewhat nonlinear manner. And as a result of that decrease in barometric pressure, you'll see the partial pressure of oxygen at every point along the oxygen transport chain from the inspired air to the alveolar air to the arterial blood and mixed venous blood is going to go down. And how far it goes down depends on how high someone goes up in elevation. Now, in general, these decreases in the PO2 at various points, and it's usually the arterial and the alveolar PO2 that are driving these changes, they're going to lead to a whole set of physiologic responses, most of which are beneficial, but occasionally are actually problematic or of no real benefit to people, such as hypoxic pulmonary uh, vasoconstriction. So this is the key environmental change that occurs at high altitude and the consequences of that change. There are other important changes in this environment, such as decreased humidity, decreased air temperature, um, increased exposure to UV light, but this is the biggest deal that people have to wrestle with when they're at uh, high elevation. Now, a couple of points about acute altitude illness before we get going. The first is that for the majority of people, the risk of developing acute altitude illness, altitude illness doesn't start until you get above about 2,400 meters in elevation. And that's roughly equivalent to 8,000 feet. And I'm gonna talk in meters, so you have to get used to that conversion. So one meter is about 3.28 feet. So you generally need to get above this elevation before someone becomes at risk for developing these problems. Some people get sick this low in elevation, others need to go much higher before they'll actually become ill. The main reason that people get sick is pretty straightforward, is that they go too high, too fast. Okay? And what that means, it's not the rate at which someone's walking during their hike for a given day. It's basically the rate at which they're increasing their sleeping elevation over the course of a trip. So someone who goes up to 15,000 feet in elevation and sleeps there, having spent only two days along the way, is way more likely to get sick than someone who takes five or six days to get to 15,000 feet before sleeping at that elevation. And then finally, the physiologic responses and the susceptibility to acute altitude illness varies markedly between individuals. So you can have a group of people all traveling at the same ascent rate, doing all the same things for prevention, Several people might do just fine, others might actually get sick. There's a lot of variability at play and you have to take that into account when you're plan, uh, planning various trips uh, in this environment. So with that brief introduction uh, out of the way, now let's move on to some cases. So I'm gonna describe a series of cases to you, ask you to come up with diagnosis or what's going on and then also do some audience response to poll you about how we're going to respond to some of these uh, problems. So our first case involves a trek in Nepal and your team has moved into the village of Lobajay at 4,940 meters in elevation. 
and there's a trip member that comes over to you because they know you're a physician. They ask you to see their friend because he's concerned about his friend's breathing pattern while he's sleeping. So you wake this person up and you find that he's got a heart rate of 101 beats per minute. His oxygen saturation is 82% breathing air. And he tells you that he's very out of breath with exertion, but if you rest for a couple of minutes, then, he's, then he feels just fine. And I'm gonna show you a movie of what he looked like before you woke him up. So what, oops. so what I would like you to do is put into the chat your thoughts. What's going on with this person? Is he sick? Is he not sick? And if he's sick, what's going on? Andy, do you want me to share chat comments uh, with you? I can actually see the chat myself. So. Okay, good. Yeah. So people can go ahead and put some thoughts in the chat as to what they think is going on. Sick or not sick? And if he's sick, what's the problem? I can play the video again while you're thinking. Not a ton of people venturing thoughts in the chat. It turns out this person's actually fine. He is demonstrating central sleep apnea or chain stokes respirations. And here you see what this would look like if you did a sleep study on this individual. He's got this crescendo decrescendo pattern in his breathing movements punctuated by periods of apnea. And accompanying those periods of apnea are cyclic depressions in his oxygen saturation. But it turns out a lot of what's being described about him, breathlessness with exertion, with rapid recovery with rest, hypoxemia, a mild tachycardia, these are all actually normal responses to high altitude. He's otherwise well, and he's demonstrating a very common problem that happens to a lot of people at altitude, even if they're not sick, central sleep apnea. So as I mentioned a little while ago, that when you're exposed to high altitude, the barometric pressure goes down and it has a lot of downstream physiologic consequences. So a decrease in the alveolar PO2 is gonna trigger hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. The decrease in your arterial PO2 triggers a whole host of responses such as an increase in your minute ventilation, increased sympathetic activity, which leads to increases in cardiac output and heart rate, you also get increased EPO secretion, which will eventually lead to increases in the hemoglobin concentration. So a whole host of physiologic responses that you will see. And importantly, as a result of these physiologic responses, people feel different at altitude than they do at sea level, right? Their ventilation is up. So they might appreciate the fact that they're breathing more rapidly or taking more deep breaths than normal. They are breathless or out of breath with exertion. And so even if they're in good physical shape, a similar degree of exertion at high altitude is gonna leave them way more out of breath than it would at sea level. Their heart rate and their blood pressure might be up. Quite often people sleep very poorly. They may not recognize that they're having central sleep apnea, but it is the driver of a lot of the sleep problems that people are having. And a lot of people urinate more frequently in the first couple of days at elevation. So it's important for people to understand that when they get up to high elevation, even if they're otherwise doing well, they're gonna feel different than they do at sea level, both at rest and with exertion. 
And you want them to understand that because you don't want to have them mistake these normal physiologic responses for evidence of acute altitude illness. People, occasionally people get confused, think that they're getting sick, and then they bail off a trip even though they were otherwise doing fine. Now, a little bit about central sleep apnea. This is something that we'll see at sea level, but only in very limited circumstances, such as people with very severe heart failure or following severe neurologic injury. But it turns out it's highly common at high altitude, even in people who are otherwise doing just fine. And it can actually persist for weeks following ascent to high elevation or with con continued ascent to higher elevations, even though someone may tell you subjectively that their sleep feels like it has improved uh, significantly. And it's thought that this may be more common in those individuals who have stronger hypoxic ventilatory responses, because that kind of plays into the abnormal feedback loops that are going on in the respiratory control centers that lead to uh, their uh, central sleep apnea. Now, in terms of management, uh, acetazolamide has actually been shown to decrease the incidence of central sleep apnea and periodic breathing at high altitude. So when used for prevention of acute mountain sickness, has this additional benefit. And there are some other medications that we commonly use for improving sleep here at sea level, which have been shown to improve uh, uh, subjective impressions of sleep at high altitude, but don't actually have any effect on periodic breathing uh, itself. Okay. All right. So let's move on to our second case. This is a 44-year-old woman who has previously ascended Mount Rainier, which is over 4,400 meters in elevation. She's been up Kilimanjaro at 5,895 meters in elevation, as well as Orizaba, a volcano in Central America, whose elevation is eluding uh, me right now. She's on her second night at 3,350 meters on Denali when she wakes up with gurgling in her lungs. The following morning, she's got an oxygen saturation of 86% at rest, which drops to 70% when she's walking. She's got some mild breathlessness with activity. She rests for that day, and the next day, her team's going to move up to a higher camp on the mountain, but she can't keep up with the group as they're ascending out of camp, and she has to turn around. And now when she's evaluated, she's got an oxygen saturation that's in the mid-70% range. She's out of breath with any exertion, and she's coughing up blood-tinged white sputum without any fevers. So I see a couple of thoughts going into the chat. So let folks give a second, share what you think might be going on with this individual. Great. So most people have concluded that she most likely has high altitude pulmonary edema or HAPE, and that would in fact be uh, the case. This is one of the three main forms of acute altitude illness that can occur following ascent. The onset's typically within about two to five days of ascents to greater than 2,400 meters in elevation. And the signs and symptoms vary based on the degree of severity. So usually early on in the illness, People are becoming out of breath with exertion that's out of proportion to what you would expect for individuals at that altitude. So in other words, they're having trouble keeping up with their group. They're needing more frequent rest breaks. And on their rest breaks, it's taking a long time for them to recover. And it's quite common for them to have a dry cough. As things get worse, that breathlessness is present with very simple activities like changing clothing, going to the bathroom, and then eventually they're out of breath at rest. They can become profoundly cyanotic and also start coughing up some blood-tinged sputum, which is the presence of red cells that have come out into the alveolar space. So the question I'm going to ask, and then we're going to poll on this one, rather than put your answers into the chat, I'll have you do an audience response poll. Descent's not feasible for this individual due to the fact that the weather is getting worse. So which of the following choices, A through E, is the next most appropriate step for managing this person's uh, problem, okay? So I'll give you a little bit of time to enter your answers as a group. So descent's not feasible, what are you gonna do? Not seeing a lot of answers. Here goes one. There we go. Let's get some answers, guys. This is a safe space. 
put your answer into question one. I think there may have been an issue just creating the questions, but all you need to do is answer question one. Oh, I see what's going on. Hmm. Um, I'll try and fix it for the next one, Andy. Okay, that sounds good. Give people a little bit more time. I'm seeing a mix of uh, people going for choice A and people going for choice E. Let me stop there and show you what we got. So most people went for choice A or choice E. There were no options, uh, no one selecting any of the other uh, options there. Okay. All right. So there is a one best answer here, and there are a couple of other answers that could actually work, one of which people didn't go for. So by far, descent is going to be the best treatment, but if infeasible, supplemental oxygen is the way to help resolve this problem. Supplemental oxygen is going to raise the alveolar PO2, blunt hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, which was driving a big rise in pulmonary artery pressure, which was leading to edema formation. A portable hyperbaric chamber, which I'll show you an example of later on, is a way to simulate descent when descent is not feasible, so would be an acceptable option if supplemental oxygen was not available. And when neither of these things are available, a pulmonary vasodilator like nifedipine is effective in order to decrease pulmonary artery pressure, which as I mentioned, is the main driver of edema formation in high altitude uh, pulmonary edema. So some studies have actually shown that if you have supplemental oxygen available, this is usually sufficient to treat high altitude pulmonary edema without having to do anything else. In this particular study, they took a large number of individuals who were diagnosed with hate between 38 and 3,100 and 3,800 meters in elevation. And they were all treated at a facility at 3,500 meters and they were randomized to get oxygen and dexamethasone, oxygen and nifedipine or oxygen alone. And you can see that the time to resolution in days is actually no different between the three groups. Now, getting them down to sea level would have clearly been uh, better and would have led to faster re resolution, but just remaining at this altitude on oxygen alone was sufficient and no different than adding on a pulmonary vasodilator or a steroid. And this turns out to actually be the approach that they use at a lot of the ski resorts in Colorado, where there's a fair incidence of high altitude pulmonary edema. Rather than sending the people back down to Denver or back to wherever they're from, they'll quite often just put them on supplemental oxygen. In fact, in many cases, they send them back to their lodge or wherever they're staying with uh, supplemental oxygen rather than admitting them to uh, the hospital. So in terms of treating high altitude pulmonary edema, the key question I think is always, where are you and do you have the ability to access a health facility? If you are in a place like some remote valley of Nepal on a trek, and there's no health facility in sight, that's the person that needs to get down to low uh, elevation. And with descent, the barometric pressure goes up, there's more oxygen available, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction goes away, and pulmonary artery pressures come down. But if descent's not feasible, then you want to try to find supplemental oxygen or put the person in a portable hyperbaric chamber. And I think it's reasonable to add on a pulmonary vasodilator like nifedipine or sildenafil if you have no other options. But if you're working in a place like a ski resort in Colorado and you're in the ED and someone shows up with high altitude pulmonary edema, they don't need to descend. You just need to get them on oxygen. And maybe consider CPAP or nifedipine if they're not responding, but quite often they respond to this alone and you can even discharge them to their lodge provided they have adequate monitoring for while they're there. If you read some of the descriptions in the literature, you'll sometimes see this like kitchen sink approach where people are given oxygen, nifedipine, acetazolamide, dexamethasone, albuterol, all things which have variously been shown over time to have some role in HAPE, but you don't need to do this type of kitchen sink approach. Supplemental oxygen and maybe nifedipine alone is gonna be adequate for most people. All right, any questions before I go on to the next case, let's see. Lauren asks, is supplemental oxygen preferred compared to the hyperbaric chamber because if you have access to both? I think supplemental oxygen is a lot easier to use. When you put someone in a portable hyperbaric chamber, it's a small little bag that zips up tightly. It's not great for claustrophobic people. 
It's not great if they have to get up and go to the bathroom and just a whole bunch of things are problematic with it. And I'll show you an example of what the bag looks like in a little bit so you'll see why that may be more of a challenge. All right, so here's our next case. This is a group of highly fit triathletes who have flown into the village of Lukla in the Everest region of Nepal at 2,800 meters. They then trek to the village of Farache over a period of two days as part of a trek to Everest base camp. And on the morning of day three, one of them comes into the Himalayan Rescue Association clinic with headache, really tired, no appetite, following a night of very poor sleep. Now, on exam, he's got an oxygen saturation of 85% breathing air, his color's poor and he appears tired. He's got clear lungs to auscultation. And when you ask him to walk heel to toe along a straight line, he does just fine. So what's the diagnosis for this individual? You can put some thoughts into the chat. a little bit more time for people to put their thoughts together. Okay, I'm seeing some votes for altitude sickness, but you got to be a little more specific because there's several forms of acute altitude illness. Med A said acute mountain sickness as well. Okay. Okay. So people are right, this individual is sick. He has some form of altitude illness. And as Med A and Lauren ventured, this person has acute mountain sickness or AMS for short. This is by far the most common problem that happens to people who get sick at high altitude way more common than high altitude uh, pulmonary edema. So if you're traveling as part of a group at high elevation, you're highly likely to see this develop in at least one or two people in that group. AMS typically comes on anywhere after about four to eight hours, six to 10 hours after someone's gotten up to elevations of 2,400 meters and above. Some people might get sick once they get above 2,400 meters. Others might not get sick until they get above about 3,000 or 3,500 meters. The altitude of onset can vary quite a lot from person to person. The main symptom is gonna be headache. But what you're looking for is headache plus one or two other things such as severe fatigue, lack of appetite, nausea, vomiting, with this persistent lightheadedness or dizziness uh, when the person is in the standing position. Okay? A headache plus one or two of those other things in someone who has come up to high altitude recently is more often than not acute mountain sickness. If you look at descriptions of AMS in the literature, poor sleep was a part of the diagnostic criterion, but that has been reevaluated over time. It's been increasingly recognized that poor sleep is present in a lot of people at altitude, even if they're not sick. So it's been taken out of the diagnostic uh, criteria. So then the question for you now is, what's the most appropriate intervention for this person, okay? We're going to answer in, just do question two, Sarah, is that right here? I uh, only see... Andy, can I can I try to pull up the poll? Yeah, please do. I'm going to end that one. Um, and then here we go. All right. Okay. So which of the following is the most appropriate uh, intervention for this patient? Should they descend, go on supplemental oxygen, start acetazolamide, start dexamethasone, or take some ibuprofen. Okay, give up just a couple more seconds. Okay, a few more votes in there. Okay, Sarah, do you want to end the poll? 
share the results. There you go. So most people went for choice A to descend to lower elevation. Good number going for acetazolamide and a couple for uh, ibuprofen. I actually think the best answer in this case is to just treat this person symptomatically with ibuprofen. You might actually consider adding acetazolamide or dexamethasone for someone who wasn't responding to this alone or if their AMS got worse. Descent and supplemental oxygen are actually going to treat the problem, but they're not necessary in this situation because for the majority of people, AMS is a mild problem and these interventions aren't warranted. Usually with just time and some symptomatic treatment, a person will get better. So when people have AMS, the first priority is stop going up in elevation. Stay put, rehydrate the individual, not because dehydration causes AMS, but because dehydration is a common problem at high altitude due to the decrease in the humidity and the increase in sensible losses through the respiratory tract. And dehydration feels a lot like acute mountain sickness. So you're trying to eliminate that as a problem. And then use symptomatic treatment, aspirin, ibuprofen, acetaminophen for the headache, maybe an anti-emetic. That works for the majority of people. Just stay put at the same elevation and the symptoms will resolve. If things do not resolve, so in other words, symptoms get worse despite appropriate treatment. They fail to improve after like a half a day or a full day of doing this stuff. Then you would consider addition of acetazolamide or dexamethasone. If the AMS is really severe at the get-go, you can add these medications right away. Of the two, they've never actually been compared in research studies to each other for the purpose of treatment, but empirically, evidence suggests that dexamethasone is probably more rapid onset and more effective at uh, treating active symptoms for individuals. And we're only gonna use descent or supplemental oxygen if the patient is not improving or worsens on these steps here, okay? So most people who get AMS can quite often continue their trip depending on what it is that the group had planned to do, okay? All right, so here's another case. You have a 42-year-old fit man who reaches 3,600 meters from sea level over two days. And he spends an additional two days taking short hikes to acclimatize. The next day, he moves up to 4,940 meters in elevation and then comes back down to sleep at 3,900 meters. So essentially, he went over a pass before coming down to 3,900 meters. And the following day, he's got a severe headache while going back up to 4,900 meters. And after a night of sleep at that elevation, he's confused. He has incoherent speech, he's disoriented and can't coordinate his foot and hand movements. So I'll let you put in the chat what you think could be going on with this individual. Okay, great. So everyone seems to be perfectly recognizing that this is a person who has more than acute mountain sickness. He may have had that early on with the severe headache, but now he's progressed and showing evidence of neurologic dysfunction, which is the big clue to the fact that this person could have high altitude cerebral edema. Okay. So the key thing about AMS is the diagnosis is made solely based on the symptoms that the person is telling you they have. There are no characteristic physical exam findings. And in particular, people should have a normal neurologic exam. If they don't have a normal neurologic exam, you have to be concerned that they have developed high altitude cerebral edema. This is generally gonna cause a global encephalopathy. So you shouldn't see focal neurologic deficits in the majority of cases. The most common things that you'll see are gonna be ataxia. And then in more severe cases, altered levels of consciousness. And if you can do a good eye exam, you might actually see evidence of papilledema. Some other things have been described, but these are way less common than the ataxia and altered mental status. If you are working at a hospital in some high altitude region and you're able to do brain imaging, a non-contrast CT would show non-specific findings of cerebral edema, such as sulcal effacement and compression of uh, the ventricles. You'll usually still see adequate gray-white differentiation early on. And then if you do MRI, on an individual, there are these characteristic changes that tend to be seen in the janu and the splenium of the corpus callosum on T2 flare, as well as diffusion-weighted uh, imaging. 
And the other thing you can see evidence of on MRI are microhemorrhages. And one of the really interesting features of it is that these microhemorrhages can persist for several months after someone has gotten back down to lower elevation and recovered from their high altitude cerebral edema. So if you're working in clinic and someone gives you a good story for HACE but had no diagnostic testing at the time and you're trying to figure out did they in fact have this, you can actually consider doing MRI. And if you see evidence of these microhemorrhages, this might have this might confirm what happened uh, during that trip at high elevation. So then the question for you now is, you'd like to get this person down or onto supplemental oxygen. But in addition to that, what other intervention do you want to initiate at this time? Sarah, if you want to go ahead and open up the poll, we can see what they think. Give about 10 more seconds. Okay. Sorry, do you want to close the poll? Great. So most people went for dexamethasone, but a few went for acetazolamide and then some for hypertonic saline and uh, mannitol. Okay. So the correct answer here is dexamethasone. This is the medication you want to get someone on when they have high altitude cerebral edema. Cetazolamide might be helpful, but this is gonna be the best medication. Diuretics have no role in haste, nor do they have any role in high altitude pulmonary edema. And in hypertonic saline and mannitol, which we often think about for managing diffuse cerebral edema and increased intracranial pressure at sea level, particularly in a hospital, have no role in the management of this disease, particularly when you're in a field environment where it's really hard to adequately monitor patients who are given these medications, and in particular, to follow their serum osmolality and their serum sodium uh, adequately. So dexamethasone is gonna be the highest priority. People should start with an eight milligram dose, followed by four milligrams every six hours, however you can get, them in, get that medication in, whether it's IV, intramuscular, or if they're able to swallow orally. Now, if the scent is not feasible, and medications are not available to deal with severe altitude illnesses, such as high altitude pulmonary edema or high altitude cerebral edema, you can use what's uh, known as the portable hyperbaric chamber. So sometimes here it called the Gamov bag, but it turns out Gamov bag is just one of three different models that are out there on the market. This is the generic name for the intervention. And what it is, is it's a bag and you put the ill person in the bag and there's this tight sealing zipper here that you close up. There's a window that you can use to look at and communicate with the person so they can easily hear you and you can hear them. And then some individual has to stand outside the bag and pump on a foot pump to inflate the bag like it's a balloon. And with inflation of the bag, the barometric pressure inside the bag goes up and it's like simulating a descent in elevation. So here's an example of how it works. This is a friend of mine wearing an altimeter watch while standing at 4,300 meters or 14,300 feet elevation outside the gamma bag. The person was put in the bag. The bag was inflated to 1.2 pounds per square inch. And now you can see the altimeter watch and what it's reading inside the bag, an elevation of 10,720 feet or 3,200 meters. So by simply putting this person in the bag, you have affected a descent of over 1,100 meters in elevation. And if you keep the person in there long enough, their symptoms will resolve. Now the question often comes up is, well, great, I put them in the bag and things got better, but what happens if I take them out of the bag? They're right back up at high altitude. Aren't they gonna get sick again? And the answer is sure, but it's not like you're gonna take them out of the bag and boom, everything's gonna come back immediately upon removal from the bag. If you kept them in there long enough, when you take them out of the bag, you've bought yourself some time that now maybe they can walk down under their own power or it's daylight and it's easier to get down or the helicopter has finally arrived and you can get them over to that, that helicopter and get them flown down off the mountain. So this has the potential to be a life-saving intervention when descent or oxygen or other things are not available. 
Now, before we go on to the next question, it looks like there's a question in the chat about rectal dexamethasone. And honestly, I don't know if there is a rectal preparation of uh, dexamethasone. So I couldn't give you a good answer to that question. All right. Any other questions before we move on? All right. So you have a 49-year-old man who's climbing Denali with a guided expedition. And his, his team has ascended from base camp at 2,280 meters up to a camp at 3,300 meters over three days. And on the fourth day, they go back down in elevation to pick up a supply cache that they had left. And on the way back up to camp, he's having difficulty keeping up with the group. And in camp, he notes that his vision's starting to narrow down. He feels tired. He's not coughing, doesn't have any chest pain, but says he can't catch his breath with any activity. They don't do a pulse oximeter check on him. And it turns out that the same guided group has another team on the mountain that's on their way back down to uh, base camp. And so they just put him on a rope with that team and send him down. So the question is, what's the problem with this individual? What's his diagnosis? Give you a little bit more time to talk amongst yourselves, share some thoughts in the chat. So let me ask a question, and you can put an answer in the chat. How many people are, are you concerned that he has high altitude pulmonary edema? Is anyone concerned that he has high altitude pulmonary edema? Yes or no in the chat. So it looks like we got some answers all over the place. Some say no hate. Some say probably not hate because he doesn't have a cough. Some say, well, he's not catching his breath. So there's some problem, you know, some respiratory problem. The answer in this case actually is who knows? He could have a lot of different things. So difficulty breathing is a very common phenomenon at high altitude. We mentioned before that even when people are doing great at altitude, there's this intense breathlessness with exertion. But upon resting, people tend to get better pretty quickly. And certainly when people have out of breath that's, you know, dyspnea that's out of proportion to what they were experiencing earlier or what other people are experiencing, you start to worry about hate. Cough does not have to be present in hate. It's common, but it's not universally uh, found. This person could be having an asthma exacerbation. He might be really anxious. Right? His vision starting to narrow down. Maybe he's just simply hyperventilating uh, in response to the physical work. Maybe he's out of shape. He's not used to carrying the very heavy loads that you have to carry on this mountain where you don't have the benefit of porters. You do all the load carrying yourself. So really, it's not clear what's going on. And I think Cooper made a great point in the chat. The mistake that was made in this patient's case was that no one checked his oxygen saturation with pulse oximetry. Because one of the key features of high altitude pulmonary edema is that at that elevation where this person is having symptoms and difficulty breathing, if they have HAPE, their oxygen saturation and their arterial PO2, if you were to do a blood gas, is going to be lower than healthy people at that elevation. And so I think when you're traveling as the medical person at high altitude, you should have a pulse oximeter. Not to just monitor how people are doing on a routine basis at high altitude and predict whether or not they're going to get sick, but to incorporate it into the evaluation of an ill individual, and in particular, someone who's having difficulty breathing. 
if their oxygen saturation is much lower than everyone else who's otherwise doing fine at that elevation, hey, as well as things like pneumonia are gonna rise much further up on your differential diagnosis. Now, these days, everyone loves ultrasound and ultrasound's getting very portable. You can actually run it on your phone. And if you are one who had one of those butterfly devices or another device that can run through your phone, or you're working in a remote clinic that had ultrasound, you can actually look for evidence of hate because it's been nicely demonstrated in the literature that people who have high altitude pulmonary edema have increased beelines or comet tails compared to healthy controls at the same elevation. There is no cutoff that has been defined in the literature for saying hate versus no hate, but in general, the higher the comet score, uh, the higher the comet tail score, the higher the likelihood of high altitude pulmonary edema in an individual who's having difficulty breathing, particularly if they have hypoxemia at that elevation. So here's our next case. You're doing a trek in Peru. And after going over a high pass at 5,200 meters in elevation, a member of the trip notes that they're having a problem with the vision in their eye. And this individual wears extended wear contact lenses and she's using wraparound sunglasses. She doesn't have any pain on the eye. And on exam, she has clear sclera. So no redness, erythema, or discharge from the eye. And when you ask her to describe what's going on, this is what her vision looks like to her when she closes the unaffected eye. So the question is, what are you gonna do for this individual? Are you gonna to descend to lower elevation, remove the contact lens, start ciprofloxacin eye drops, start oral dexamethasone, or tell this person to remain out of the sun in their tent for two days while the group waits to move on? All right, about another five seconds. Sorry, you can stop the poll. All right, let's share these results. So most people went for choice A, but a smattering went for choice B and choice E as well. I think choice A is the correct answer in this particular case. This is a person who needs to get down to lower elevation. And what this individual has developed is what's referred to as a high altitude retinal hemorrhage. Turns out that this is a really common problem when people trek above about 4,500 meters in elevation or get to even higher elevations. You don't hear about it that often because in the majority of cases, the hemorrhages are small and placed far out in the periphery of the retina and so people aren't symptomatic. But if you do dedicated ophthalmologic exams with retinal cameras in large numbers of people traveling to high altitude has been done in certain studies, you see that the incidence is actually higher than you would think. So the majority of these are asymptomatic. They're small, they're out in the periphery, but if they are large or occur near the macula, that's when you can get painless vision loss and a, but otherwise white and quiet eyes. So nothing to suggest a corneal ulcer or conjunctivitis, for example. These people need to get down in elevation and they should not go higher on the trip if at all feasible. They need to see an ophthalmologist and be cleared by an ophthalmologist before going back up to high elevation in the future. Other eye problems can develop at high altitude. So when you go up in elevation, way more ultraviolet light exposure, particularly if you're traveling on snow covered terrain. So if you don't have sunglasses or have poor quality sunglasses, it's very easy to burn the surface layer of the eye and develop ultraviolet keratitis or what's referred to as snow blindness. People who use extended wear contact lenses are at increased risk for infection and corneal ulcers. And the reason is the cornea gets its oxygen supply from diffusion from the environment. And the contact lenses are kept in too long. It can decrease the oxygen supply to the cornea, predisposing to ischemia and infection. And then finally, for travel to very, very high elevations, people who have had various types of refractive eye surgeries, um, 
may actually have problems. And many of you, if you would read John Krakauer's book, Into Thin Air, the Dallas pathologist, Beck Weathers, had had a radial keratotomy in the past. And when he went up to above base camp on Mount, uh, excuse me, above the high camp on Mount Everest, had loss of vision because of changes in the shape of the cornea made it impossible for him to see. There's some thought that LASIK may also predispose to problems. And these are all at very, very high elevations above 20,000 feet uh, or more. Uh, and then photoreactive keratotomy is thought to be uh, okay. All right, our second to last case. You have a 22 year old man who travels to Colorado with his college friends for a winter ski trip. And they travel from sea level to 2,700 meters over a single day by airplane and then by car and decide, hey, big powder day, we're going to do some afternoon runs at the ski resort. And on the second day, he's confused, he's lethargic, and he remains back at the group's rental unit while everyone else goes skiing. And then on the morning of the third day, he's attended and brought into the emergency department where he's got an oxygen saturation of 50%. Chest radiograph is done, it shows bilateral alveolar opacities, while his head CT is read as normal. So what problem or problems does this individual have? share some thoughts in the chat. COVID-19 is actually not a bad thought, <laughs> given the uh, ease of spread in this uh, epidemiologic setting. Any other thoughts? Looks like Sylvia and the Med A team have thought about whether he could have high altitude pulmonary edema. And then Sarah has raised concern for pace as well. These are all perfectly valid thoughts. Here, if someone is very hypoxemic at high altitude, and maybe have tunned it enough that he can't tell you about dyspnea and exertion, and with this degree of hypoxemia, you would certainly be worried about high altitude pulmonary edema, particularly with opacities on chest imaging. And then the question is, does he have haste in addition to this or not? Okay, so it's certainly possible. So the challenge in this situation is when people have hate and it's really severe, they're gonna be very hypoxemic. And severe hypoxemia, as you see in the hospital, can actually cause encephalopathy, what we refer to as hypoxic encephalopathy. So what could you do to tease out whether the encephalopathy is due to hypoxic encephalopathy alone or concurrent cerebral edema that just isn't severe enough to be picked up on a CT scan at this point? Put some thoughts in the chat. What could you do? One thought is give some empiric dexamethasone. And in a couple of folks, Med A and Sylvia Stelmacher have asked, what happens if I put the person on oxygen? I think that's a great option in this case. Put them on supplemental oxygen and look at the response. If it's hypoxic encephalopathy, as soon as you raise the oxygen saturation of supplemental oxygen, they should start to clear relatively quickly. Whereas if they've started to develop high altitude cerebral edema, while oxygen or descent is ultimately the best treatment for that, the improvement is not seen very quickly as it would be with hypoxic encephalopathy. So this is a quick and dirty way to sort out right off the bat whether you've got haste along with HAPE or just HAPE alone. In the end, if you're in a field environment and you're not sure, treat for both at the same time. Add on dexamethasone as part of your treatment regimen. The risks are way outweighed by the potential benefits if they do in fact have developing cerebral edema. All right. And then here's our last case. 
you have a 45 year old man and his 43 year old wife who are planning to climb uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. And both of them are healthy. They have no chronic medical problems. He's actually never been above 2,500 meters in the past while she's actually been up to the summit of Mount Rainier without any problems. They're planning to do uh, what's known as the Machame route on Kilimanjaro. They're gonna reach the summit on day six and then descend and finish on the seventh day and they're seeking some advice about what you would do to avoid problems with the altitude during their climb. And so if you wanna unmute yourselves and share some thoughts or wanna put some thoughts into the chat about what you would tell them about how they can prevent problems related to the altitude. And again, you can put some thoughts in the chat or uh, unmute yourself and share them through the microphone. Okay. All right, so a couple of thoughts have come through the chat. People have talked about doing some acclimation hikes sleeping at lower altitude when possible. Actually a little challenging to do that because this guiding company is gonna to try to take them up at a standard ascent rate. Each day they're gonna be moving to a different camp. In other circumstances, this might be beneficial. We talked about starting some acetazolamide and maybe some practice climbs at high altitude beforehand. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then a variety of things suggested by Lauren like slow ascent, some acetazolamide, Sylvia wants to put this person in a hypoxic tent at home. I'm not sure the man and woman will have great relations with each other if they're sleeping inside a hypoxic tent for long periods of time, but they can sure as heck give it a try if they want. So, all right. So I mentioned the key point before about why it is that people get sick when they travel to high altitude. And by far, the main reason is simple. They go too high, too fast. This is one of the earliest studies that established this relationship. It was done in Nepal. What they did is they looked at trekkers going to Everest Base Camp. And with that route, you have two options. You can fly to the village of Lukla at 2,800 meters and then start to trek from there. Or you can walk from Kathmandu to the village of Lukla over a period of about five to 10 days and then do the trek from that point. And they looked at the incidence of acute mountain sickness in the two groups. And you can see that it was far higher in those who flew into Lukla rather than those who did the trek the entire distance, okay? So overly rapid ascents are the main ways that people get sick. So the best method for prevention is slow the rate of ascent. And what's generally recommended is once people get above about 3000 meters in elevation, you wanna limit the increase in the sleeping elevation to about three to 500 meters per night. And every three to four days, the group should take a rest day, sleep at the same elevation for at least another night. On that rest day, they can go take a hike, they can do nothing, they can read their book, whatever. But the key thing is stay at the same elevation for a second night to give the body time to acclimatize and have those beneficial physiologic responses that will help decrease the risk of altitude illness. This works for the majority of people. There are pharmacologic options that are available in certain situations. The most commonly used medication is going to be acetazolamide. Right, or diamox, as it's often called, dexamethasone, a perfectly valid alternative. If people have had high altitude pulmonary edema in the past, nifedipine is used to blunt the rise in pulmonary artery pressures. It is not used in people who've never had any acute altitude illness before. So then the question is, how do you decide who needs medications versus just relying on this alone? And the problem is it's very difficult to predict ahead of time who is going to get sick. There's nothing you can look at it on an individual in terms of physical exam or blood tests to say, you're gonna get it, you are not. And if they've never been to altitude before, who knows? So usually what you can do is take a look at the ascent profile and ask a variety of questions. How fast are they going on the, how high are they going on the first day? What's the rate of increase that's planned in the sleeping elevation for the trip? Have they been sick before? Are they building in a climatization base? And if they're deemed to have a moderate to high risk ascent profile, then 
you're going to put them on pharmacologic pro, uh, prophylaxis. But if they go into a relatively low elevation, the ascent rate's very slow, they've never been sick before, you don't need to use any medications at all. There's more specific criteria that are listed that incorporate these things in the set of guidelines from the Wilderness Medical Society. And one of the things that's in that set of guidelines is that all ascents of Mount Kilimanjaro are considered high risk ascents. The guiding groups on Kilimanjaro, particularly the local guiding outfits, are notorious for taking people up the mountain way too fast. And there is a very, very high incidence of acute mountain sickness and other illnesses on that mountain. And for that reason, Pharmacologic prophylaxis is strongly indicated for anyone who's going up Kilimanjaro who has no idea how they're going to react to the environment. Someone has been to altitude a lot before and knows they tolerate it just fine. They may not need it, but for the altitude naive traveler, I would strongly consider it for Kilimanjaro. Okay. So that brings us to the end of the last case. Let's summarize some of the key points. The first thing is remember, hypobaric hypoxia is going to trigger a whole series of physiologic responses. And as a result of those responses, people are going to feel different. People need to know that they're going to feel different so they don't mistake those normal physiologic responses for evidence of acute altitude illness. Descent is going to be the best treatment for all forms of acute altitude illness, but you usually only need it when people have HAPE, PACE, or very severe AMS or AMS that's not resolving with appropriate measures. Most people are going to develop AMS, and they can just use symptomatic treatment at the same elevation, and in most cases, things are going to resolve. There are a variety of other things that happen at high altitude besides AMS, haste, and HAPE. So you have things like high altitude retinal hemorrhage. People have a habit of having panic attacks. You might see an asthma exacerbation. So you have to be on the lookout for some of these other problems that can occur. And then finally, the single best way to prevent all forms of acute altitude illness is to slow the rate of ascent down where feasible. Okay. And with that, I'm done and I'm happy to take any questions. And then the uh, code here uh, can be used for evaluations. Thank you so much, Andy. That was Awesome. Um, I'm just going to put a plug in for the speaker eval. There's also a link in the chat that I'm just putting in now. And I see a couple questions. So um, the I think both questions get at the same thing. Do you have to worry about the rate of descent? And the answer is no. This is very different than diving. Uh, with diving, you don't have to worry about the rapidity with which someone goes lower in the water, but you definitely have to worry about the rapidity with which someone comes back up to the surface of the water. But that's not an issue at high altitude at all. And the reason is the barometric pressure changes that you're dealing with at high altitude, although important physiologically, are really small, particularly compared to diving. So you would have to go up to the summit of Mount Everest that over 8,850 meters in elevation before the barometric pressure would be one third of what it is at sea level. But with diving, you need to just go to 30 meters in depth and the barometric pressure has already tripled. And so way bigger pressure changes with diving, way bigger consequences of coming up too quickly, but not an issue at high altitude. Any other questions? All right. Great. Sounds good. I think we'll end it there. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.